Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Tuesday, June 23rd. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Our New Testament reading tonight is from John's Gospel, chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, the story of the resurrection. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, and he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped in to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Our reading tonight is from the Large Catechism, Article 5, on the Sacrament of the Altar. And I believe we will actually be in this for four days, so for the rest of the week. And then we will begin the small card, small called articles on Monday. Part 5, the Sacrament, sacrament of the Altar. Just as we have heard about holy baptism, so we must also speak about the other sacrament, in these same three points, what is it, what are its benefits, and who is to receive it? And all these points are established through the words by which Christ has instituted the sacrament. 
Everyone who desires to be a Christian and go to the sacrament should know them. For it is not our intention to let people come to the sacrament and administer it to them if they do not know what they seek or why they come. The words, however, are these. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Here also we do not wish to enter into controversy and fight with the defamers and blasphemers of the sacrament, but to learn first, as we did with baptism, what is of the greatest importance. The chief point is God's word and ordinance or command. For the sacrament has not been invented nor introduced by any man. Without anyone's counsel and deliberation, it has been instituted by Christ. The Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, and the Creed keep their nature and worth, even if you never keep, pray, or believe them. So also this honorable sacrament remains undisturbed. Nothing is withdrawn or taken from it, even though we use and administer it unworthily. Do you think God cares about what we do or believe, as though on that account he should allow his ordinance to be changed? Why, in all worldly matters, everything stays the way God has created and ordered it, no matter how we employ or use it. This point must always be taught, for by it the chatter of nearly all the fanatical spirits can be repelled. For they regard the sacraments, unlike God's word, as something that we do. Now, what is the sacrament of the altar? Answer. It is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, in and under the bread and wine, which we Christians are commanded by Christ's word to eat and to drink. Just as we have said that baptism is not simple water, so here also we say that, though the sacrament is bread and wine, it is not mere bread and wine, such as are ordinarily served at the table. But this is bread and wine included in and connected with God's word. It is the word, I say, that makes and sets the sacrament apart. So it is not mere bread and wine, but is and is called Christ's body and blood. For it is said, when the word is joined to the element or natural substance, it becomes a sacrament. The saying of St. Augustine is so properly and so well put that he has scarcely said anything better. The word must make a sacrament out of the element, or else it remains a mere element. Now it is not the word or ordinance of a prince or emperor, but it is the word of the grand majesty at whose feet all creatures should fall and affirm it, as he says, and accept it with all reverence, fear, and humility. With this word you can strengthen your conscience and say, if a hundred thousand devils together with all fanatics should rush forward crying, how can bread and wine be Christ's body and blood, and such? I know that all spirits and scholars together are not as wise as is the divine majesty in his little finger. Now here stands Christ's word, take, eat, this is my body, drink of it, all of you, this is my blood of the New Testament, and so on. Here we stop to watch those who will call themselves his masters and make the matter different from what he has spoken. It is true indeed that if you take away the word or regard the sacrament without the words, you have nothing but mere bread and wine. But if the words remain with them as they shall and must, then by virtue of the words it is truly Christ's body and blood. What Christ's lips say and speak so it is. He can never lie or deceive. Titus 1, 2. It is easy to reply to all kinds of questions about which people are troubled at the present time, such as this one. Can even a wicked priest serve at and administer the sacrament? And whatever other questions like this there may be. For here we conclude and say, even though an impostor takes or distributes the sacrament, a person still receives the true sacrament, that is, Christ's true body and blood just as truly as a person who receives or administers it in the most worthy way. For the sacrament is not founded upon people's holiness, but upon God's word. Just as no saint on earth, indeed no angel in heaven, can make bread and wine be Christ's body and blood. So also, no one can change or alter it, even though it is misused. The word by which it became a sacrament and was instituted does not become false because of the person or his unbelief. For Christ does not say, if you believe or are worthy, you receive my body and blood. No, he says, take, eat, and drink. This is my body and blood. Likewise, he says, do this, i.e., what I now do, institute, give, and ask you, take. 
This is like saying, no matter whether you are worthy or unworthy, you have here his body and blood by virtue of these words that are added to the bread and wine. Note and remember this well, for upon these words rest all our foundation, protection, and defense against all errors and deception that have ever come or may yet come. So we have, in a brief way, covered the first point that deals with this sacrament's essence. Now examine further the effectiveness and benefits that really caused the sacrament to be instituted. This is its most necessary part, so that we may know what we should seek and gain there. This is plain and clear from the words just mentioned. This is my body and blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Briefly, that is like saying, for this reason we go to the sacrament, there we receive such a treasure by and in which we gain forgiveness of sins. Why so? Because the words stand here and give us this. Therefore, Christ asks me to eat and drink so that this treasure may be my own and may benefit me as a sure pledge and token. In fact, it is the very same treasure that is appointed for me against my sins, death, and every disaster. And that is where we will conclude this evening, and we'll pick it back up again tomorrow evening. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we praise your fathomless mercy, with which you take pity on sinful men. All the prophets and apostles preach this to us in your holy word. Let our hope not be put to shame when we pray to you for all who suffer evil at this time. For behold, the evil foe has become mighty, and the great ones of this world rule often with unrighteousness. O God, who in former times caused your saints to overcome injustice, strengthen also today all who stand in need of your help. Grant that all prisoners of war held as slaves and sacrifices of earthly wrath may return to their home. Stand by all refugees and homeless people and be their justice. Be a father to the widows and orphans with your strong protection. Go through bars and fences to those who are imprisoned for the sake of your name. Strengthen them for a good witness and let them not waver in the confession of your name. Teach us through their example and the example of so many holy martyrs to be ever watchful of the confession of your son's name. Let us not be put to shame when the evil foe lays his hand on us. But if it is your will that we be persecuted for confessing Jesus as our Lord and only Savior, then support us in your grace that we may withstand all trials and grant us peaceful rest. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, you overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life. We humbly pray that we may live before you in righteousness and purity forever. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.